Dumb. Who? And weird. Podcast. Well, thank you for being on today with us. We appreciate it. Oh, yeah. Yeah, this is, uh, you're actually our first uh, call-in guest, actually, so. Yes. So oh, good. I'm glad, glad to pop your cherry. <laughs> <laughs> appreciate it. Uh, we, you know, we did a little, we did a little bit of research, um, into what you do and we think it's really cool, uh, that, you know, you, uh, are trying to encourage people to have more, you know, intimate relationships with each other. Cause I feel like, you know, with millennials, uh, a lot of, a lot of the issues that I feel like we deal with as millennials is a lot of people, this, this is, this is the way I feel about it. I, I feel like a lot of it's a transactional a lot of times, uh, these days with our generation. Um, I notice it when I'm on dating apps and stuff like that. So, you know, that's one, uh, that's one of the reasons why I wanted to go into this today. So maybe, you know, you can kind of give people advice on for millennials to like, you know, kind of quit doing the more transactional stuff. I mean, like OnlyFans and stuff like that. Because every time I go on like OkCupid, I've talked to other buddies of mine, you know, men and women, and they say they notice it's just a lot of people on there just advertising transactional stuff like OnlyFans uh, and stuff like that. A lot of their cam girl stuff. A lot too. of cam girl stuff, you know. Mm-hmm. So uh, we just kind of wanted to talk about that today to kind of get your insight on that. So, yeah, um, I think there's 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 so many different trends that I think are really interesting. Um, the first thing is that I would say that generally, um, dating apps. It's funny to think about millennials. Millennials are like <laughs> 25 to 40 years old. They're yeah. like grown yes. ass people. Yeah. You know? <laughs> and when when you, I I'm literally tailing into the boomers. I'm 60 years old and when I think about millennials, I think they must be like little kids, but they're not. <laughs> they're grown ass people. They're married. They got babies. They're pissed off at each other. They're thinking about getting divorces. You know, they're 40 years old and they haven't gotten married yet. Or they're 40 years old and they're like, I got to have a baby now, you know, that kind of thing. <laughs> yeah. So mm-hmm. yeah, there's definitely a lot of, um, there's, there's just, um, Millennials grew up in a generation where dating apps just became the way people found each other. And Mm. the interesting thing about that is that it had them become more particular in some ways about what was important to them. Uh But it also, in other ways, made them much more open to dating out of their traditional, the people who came before them dated local people who looked like them who were probably Mm. you know of you know european descent versus from latin america or whatever now i think it's the majority of babies born today are mixed ethnicity parent Mm -hmm. parents and college educated people are more likely to marry someone from another you know, race, if you will, or whatever you want to call it. I don't know what you even call it. Um, than ever before in the history of our company, mm-hmm. uh, country. Mm-hmm. So I think that's very interesting. Then you add in this mix of, it's no longer just boys and girls. Now we are gender spectrum or gender non-binary. You know, yep. I'm a, I'm a heterosexual, cisgender, <laughs> blah, blah, blah. You know, you've got to have your all your monikers. Mm-hmm. And people are still kind of coming up to speed and learning all of that. Mm-hmm. And then you had that whole kind of uh, Trump era of our, our um, political landscape, which really bifurcated people. You know, uh-huh. the Democrats and the Republicans have oh, never yeah. been further apart. And so there are a lot of people who are, saying, um, you know, I, I, I like my first deal breaker is if they're a Republican, I would never in a million years fuck them, mm. right? Whatever, those kinds of things. And then mm. there's mm. the whole um, open poly monogamish, non-monogamous, you know, whole world as well. Mm. So if you just want to get married and have a baby and everybody you meet is like non-monogamous, monogamish, you know, <laughs> Mm-hmm. Yeah. Then there's that piece of it too. So there's just like so many facets of dating that have to be navigated and negotiated before you ever get to the actual date. And then when you get to sex, it's like, okay, everything in this generation has been informed by porn. Mm-hmm. Yep. So what does sex really look like? And movies do an, a terrible job of showing good sex. And yet people fundamentally want intimacy, 
connection. Mm -hmm. We want to be seen. We want to be loved. We want to be adored. We want to be respected. We want to be pleasured. We want to have orgasms. We want to have incredible erotic adventures together. Mm -hmm. We want to have all yep. those things too. Mm -hmm. So it's like, wow, once you, you, once you navigate that landmine of all of the monikers and all of the different pieces to, to finally find someone that might be a values match for you, uh -huh. because that's what we're really talking about is values matches now. Mm -hmm. um, and then you get together with them and the only things you've ever watched are shitty movies and crappy porn. And you're <laughs> like, I'm not sure what to do. You know, uh, so that makes it quite difficult. And also people run through people quickly. They don't, you, you know, if you, if you start to date someone and you like them and you're having a good time and you start having sex with them, it really takes a good six months of consistent sex to get your feet under you as a couple mm -hmm. to kind of figure out what each partner likes, the kind of touch that turns them on, the different experiences they like to have, um, growing your connection together, learning each other's bodies, feeling comfortable with each other, mm -hmm. trying some new things, having some failures that you can laugh about, you know, also, I think that's a really important part of creating a good sexual connection with someone isn't just all it's the losses it's the the things that went <laughs> south that you tried and realized they weren't so great you know mm -hmm. um so i think those are some of the challenges mm -hmm. that millennials yes. have mm -hmm. and are navigating mm -hmm. that can seem so overwhelming that it's like oh fuck it i'll just be celibate <laughs> 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 you know? I'll just watch porn. I'll just go on only ch only fans, you know, or whatever it is. I mean, it can be <laughs> super easy to give up, which is why you read those articles all the time. Those clickbait articles mm -hmm. that are like millennials are having less sex than anybody in any generation before them or something, which I really think that's bullshit. <laughs> I think that's just clickbait because I think people generally are having more sex than in previous generations Yeah, and with more people. Yeah, I believe yeah. that. And I know there's a phenomenon where the body counts for millennials are way higher than the previous generations, um, unfortunately. And I think like, I don't know, I think it kind of denigrates like a lot of things when you do that, when you do too much, you know, over, I, I call it like over simulation, you know, me and the girl that I, I, I'm dating, we, we went to this resort. Uh, it's a, it's a nudist colony. And we kind of told them oh. a little bit about our escapades. You know, I lost my virginity when I was 15 years old, you know, and, uh, you know, she had a similar story where she lost her virginity in high school too. And we kind of told her, talked about our body counts and stuff. And all these older folks were like, these are people in like their sixties and seventies were like, Oh, that's so cool. You guys have had a very well-rounded life. And I'm just like, actually, I kind of wish I would have just met somebody that I really like and explored like a really deep relationship with them. And then I kind of, yeah. you know, I've kind of went into a little bit about what, it's like dating as a millennial, and a lot of them kind of just got a little, like, salty about it. Like, whoa, that doesn't sound that fun at all. It's like, it, it isn't sometimes because, like, you know, the asexual thing that you hear about a lot, um, there's periods where millennials will become more asexual because they get so stimulated, and they won't have sex for a while. I mean, I knew a guy that didn't yeah. have sex for, like, a year. He went very asexual, and then after that year, he went back to having sex again, you know? So it's a really weird, interesting phenomenon, and I've kind of noticed it, and I, I like 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 you were talking about earlier about uh, you know like the way people date now. It's it's very interesting because I notice a lot of people that I know when they date, they don't give themselves enough time to get to know that person. It's like at the first sign of some kind of issue, they just whoosh, dip, and you never hear from them again. It's you know we call it ghosting is what we call it. Yeah, <laughs> so, exactly. So yep, I know about ghosting. Yeah. yeah, I think that's one of the things that I like to really explain to people is to understand your values first mm. um, and to really pre-qualify people. Mm. It's less about how many dates you go on and more about finding the best people to date that are the right values match for you. I mean, if oh. you're a if you're a, you know, raving liberal, you're just never going to be happy with a uh, a MAGA person. And mm. if you're, um, you know, if you're a non-monogamous open relationship yeah. idealist, uh -huh. mm. <laughs> which you have to be, to be one of those, because it's not easy to navigate. Yeah, absolutely. Um, 
then mm-hmm. you're oh, not yeah. going, the person you date who wants to be monogamous is going to be always be upset with you because you keep bringing up non-monogamy. Yeah. So getting really clear on what's right for you, at, at least right now, mm-hmm. and and being willing to stay, say those things and stand for those things in your own life mm-hmm. are, it's more important than ever because we are no longer a homogenous culture. We are a culture of many, many niches, mm-hmm. but the niches run on values, not on ethnicity and cultural upbringing anymore. Mm-hmm. So, I mean, in some cases they do, but not that often. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah, that makes sense. So the pre-qualifications, I think, are very important. And that's one of the beautiful things about online dating apps is you can say, hey, before we get to get, you know, and, and what I like to do is I like to have a Zoom call first before we get out of our houses and go, <laughs> you know, meet in meet space. <laughs> mm-hmm. um, I'd, I'd like to have a Zoom call with you because that's so telling. Mm. It's very telling when you can hear their voice, you can hear their intonation, You can gain so much information from a video chat. And most of the apps now have video chat on them. So it's really easy to pre-qualify people that way. But before you even do that step, I think it's worthwhile to know what your deal breakers are and what you're looking for Mm -hmm. and ask those questions. And one of the things that I think is reasonable is to say, I've got kind of this little laundry list of things to make sure that we're a good values match before we go down the road of getting together. Mm -hmm. Um, You know, you'll look good on the pictures, but who knows? So I was wondering if you'd be willing to answer some questions for me. And there's no wrong answers, but Mm -hmm. it's helpful for me. And I would be willing to answer any questions for you. Mm -hmm. And then usually they're like, okay, go ahead, shoot. And then you ask the questions and, and then they ghost you <laughs> because <laughs> yeah. they, they know when they answer the questions that they're not yeah. your match. Absolutely. And so yes. it just takes care of the problem. And then you've essentially all your, it's a numbers game. That's the other thing that I think is really important in, in dating of dating for any age really is that you are, you are playing a numbers game. You've got to have a lot of deal flow in the pipeline. And then once you find those people who are values match, who you liked talking to on video, who you met in person and it was good, then you've got a pretty good, solid list of prospects you're working. And you can have some fun and go out and learn things from them and have an experience with them and see if you want more. Mm, yeah. I mean, that's kind, of, think- that's kind of how my, my relationship went with my wife. Yeah, he's he's been yeah. he's been in a committed relationship for a long time, which is not Ooh. very common for a lot of millennials. But yeah, I know, I've been um, been with my wife for eleven years. We were dating each right. other for six years, and we went through the motions for six months, a lot of communication, and then eventually, yeah. we got sexually active. And like you said, you know, it's all trial and error. So for a <laughs> while, we were we were just kind of going through it because it's like you said, too many bad movies and too much shitty porn will teach you the wrong things. And that was the first time I would actually say I was like really into somebody I was with because before that I'd only been with like two other people and I didn't have, I don't have a body count or anything. So I think I got lucky when I met the person that I met because we've just been communicating and going through all this stuff, always finding new and interesting things to do. Cause it's like, we got really kinky when I joined the military, like we do dress up and everything. We were, yeah, we were just exploring anything, and I have to say, it's been a nice, wild ride. That's so good. Mm-hmm. Yeah, one of the things I'm developing right now, I'm going to be down in Austin um, speaking at the end of the month at the Paleo, Paleo FX conference, and I'm going to be taking my audience through what I like to call my sex life bucket list. It's basically uh-huh. a sexual self-assessment process. And I do it kind of like a guided visualization. I have this this document and I'll take them and I'll print them out there in the audience, but I am bringing this online. Um, I don't know when this podcast is coming out, but sometime soon you can bookmark Mm sexlifebucketlist.com. Because we want to make sure that it's completely 
private and there's no personally identifiable information. So people have to opt in to get to the survey, to the assessment, mm. but then I don't know who you are. And I want you to be able to print it out and mm. show your partner. So you and your partner can kind of go through it together if you are partnered. Mm. And essentially what yeah. I've found from being, you know, my title is intimacy expert to millions. And what I really do for people is I, I have written hundreds of passionate lovemaking techniques. I teach people how to transform having sex, just friction, performance, you know, I'm just going to rub my genitals on your genitals and get off into mm. passionate lovemaking, heart connection, super erotic, sensual, really orgasmic adventures together. And I do that and teach people bedroom communication skills because that was one of the things that you said, Nick. You said that it was communication skills that were really the thing for you. Yes. That, mm. that allowed you to try a lot of stuff because you could talk about anything. Mm. And so many people are afraid to say what they want. And that's why I like to give people the permission to s explain their values and, and filter for values when they're dating. Because people don't feel like they should that they should be able to ask questions and stuff. Like they, people are shy, and they're shy about talking about sex and about what they want as well. So this sex life bucket list is me essentially giving you a whole bunch of ideas of possible things you could do together. That's what people want from me. It's not just the techniques. It's not just the communication skills. It's what can we do that's fun? How do I essentially give you permission to have fun and then give you ideas and inspire you? Mm. And so I'm really looking forward to take, it'll be my second time taking a live audience through this kind of guided visualization. I'm trying to make it as sexy as possible. I basically take you on this, you know, audio erotic journey while you're in the event with me. And I describe all of these different situations and scenarios. And when you take this assessment, you basically are just saying, you know, uh, yes, I would do this. And it's kind of like an ABC. The A's are, this is definitely going on my sex, <laughs> my sex life bucket list. I want to do this for sure. What a great idea. Oh my God. I love this. B's are, it's not going to go on my sex life bucket list, but if it's on my, if it's on my partner's sex life bucket list, I would totally do this for them because when you have a partner, both of you, if you're empowered to kind of like always be looking for what turns you on, as you age, you like different things. As you mature, you're sexually maturing, you're gaining more skill, you're having more experiences, you're becoming more comfortable with your body, you're expanding your orgasmic potential, you're improving your communication, you're, you're learning each other, you're just, you know, you're incrementing, you're getting better. And so what you wanted in your 20s is different than your 30s, is different than your 40s. It just keeps getting better. Mm. And so the Bs are, it's not for me. It's not, it doesn't go, to, not going to go on my bucket list, but I would totally do it if my partner wanted to. And then the Cs are, it's not for me right now. I never say never because you'd be surprised how many things you end up being willing to do that actually turn you on when you used to not think they were interesting at all and maybe even thought they were weird. So... It's really fun to do this. And then you end up with your A's and that's kind of your bucket list. And then you are essentially, you know, putting a stake in the ground that these are things you want to put your attention on and experiences you want to have. And when you have them, you're actually focusing on your sexuality and learning and growing. And your, your sexuality is very similar to your personal growth. It's if you're a personal growth mindset person who also loves sex, that kind of a thing is really helpful. It's great for couples. I mean, I, on my phone, I'm, I'm holding up my phone for those of you watching, listening to the podcast, I'm holding up my phone because I keep a little thing called my sex life bucket list in my notes on my phone. <laughs> and every time I think of some crazy shit I want to do, I write it down because I forget it in the heat of the moment. I rethink about it in the heat of the moment. Mm. And then I forget it when I'm kind of out of that trancy mind state of my sexuality. So that's how I keep, you know, when I, I pretty much have a date with my husband of some kind, almost every day of the week, we do something. And I never know what it's going to be. 
And he's very, very flexible about what that might be. And usually he kind of lets me just say, you know what I feel like doing today? And he's like, what do you feel like doing? And he's always a yes to it. So it keeps it really fun for us because there's always something I want to do every day that's different than yesterday. And I think that's also a really important piece of this is that the variety is what keeps new relationship energy hot in longer term relationships. You have to do new stuff. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. I, I honestly think if I wasn't constantly in that sort of a mindset that it would have gotten dry and maybe that would have led to like marriage counseling or a divorce. Yeah. Like yep. I've seen a lot of people have that happen where they stop communicating with their spouse and they stopped being interesting with each other. And eventually yeah. it led to them separating. Yeah. That sounds about right. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> it's, it's usually sex or money. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Always. Always is, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I notice, I notice that happens with a lot of divorces. Um, you know, especially people my age group. I'm sure everybody deals with that. You know, my uh, my dad is actually the same age as you. Um, he's a oh. a 61, um, and uh, you know, he 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 told me that back in the day, dating back in the early 80s was very different than dating now. Like you actually had to go to a bar or something or to like a club and you had to like get to know somebody. And then he said, you know, you you didn't have a profile to kind of give you like a little. Little, little test of what's going on because even when I was a young teenager we still had dating online dating was still like a was still like a thing you know um yeah. it was like really 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 popular uh but you know um he was just telling me what it was like to you know dating in the, the early 80s and you know you you <laughs> took a really big risk with somebody because you really just didn't you really really yeah, didn't you were, know them it was like a door-to-door <laughs> salesperson you know you're trying to sell <laughs> what you are and what you can make in the relationship or the one night stand, whatever you were looking for at that time. Do did, would you yeah. say would you say you preferred the old style of dating back in the eighties, or do you like the way it? Do you think it's a lot cooler now the way it is now? It's better now. It's better now. Okay, because you have access to so many more people. Mm. Yeah, that's definitely true. Um, your net is so much wider. Mm. So as long as you know what's important to you, as long as you understand what you value and need out of a relationship, mm. which I think is is really, uh, you know, I, I always am kind of hammering relationship values. One of my most popular books that I've ever written is called Relationship Magic. Mm. And it's a little workbook. It's at myrelationshipmagic.com. Mm. And it's a little workbook. I'll send it to you guys mm. that um, helps you discover your top for relationship values, what it is mm. that you want most out of a relationship. Mm -hmm. And this is not for just the fucking around type of thing. That's a totally different thing. Mm. This is for, I want to have a relationship with someone. I want to date them, maybe fall in love, maybe get together, you know, mm -hmm. we'll see. But if you understand what it is that you want most out of a relationship, you can describe it to the person that you're dating. And then they can just focus on those things that you want and need. And then you feel like you're in a, the perfect relationship with them. Mm. And you can do the same for them because their needs and what they want out of the relationship are completely different than what you want. Mm -hmm. So an example might be um, she's looking for security. Yep. And that means you know, really watching out for her, keeping an eye on her, keeping her safe. I mean, women are prey. So that's a very, very common thing. We need, we need, honestly, we need protection mm. um, because the world is dangerous out there. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So that's a real common one. But also women today, we, you know, we're, we're very egalitarian with our male partners and we want freedom. We want the freedom to go do things we want, but we want you to always keep your eye on us and keep us safe, you know? So that might be something that the woman is looking for and maybe she wants family or maybe she's looking for growth and she likes to do new things. Maybe she's an adventurous and she really likes to get out and do a lot of stuff. You know, I want to go rock climbing. I want to go four wheel driving. I want to go kayaking. I want to do whatever. Um, or she might be someone who really needs honesty because she always felt insecure because she never really was with people in the past who were really honest with her. And so she needs you to be super straightforward and just tell her everything. So that might be, a t you know, a, a woman might say, those are my things where a man might say, 
My number one is passion. I want recreational companionship, physical companionship, affection, great sex. I want you to be flirty and sexy. I want you to wear cute clothes and lingerie and slutty shoes for me. I want you, you know, I just, that's what I like. I want you to be like the plus up for me in my sexy world, sexy land experience. Mm -hmm. And I want you to be um, maybe um, somebody who really has a deep faith faith might be important to you or it might be mm -hmm. I don't care at all I need someone who's an atheist because I could never be with someone who cares about faith. so you just kind of go through the list and the workbook helps you figure out what it is that you want most growth mindset um, you know there's commu high communicators people who are introverts need a lot of alone time it's um, quite telling once you understand what it is that you want most and when you explain that to a person they're like that's like falling off a log for me to give that to you. I would be happy to give you your alone time, tell you the truth all the time and wear slutty high heels for you. Okay, great. I can do that. You know, so, and, or someone might be, I don't know. I just need to be with you all the time. I don't, I don't want to be alone. I I'm looking for companionship. You know, I don't, I don't want someone who needs a lot of space and it really helps you understand mm -hmm. whether someone's a good match for you or not, but at a fundamental relationship level. Yeah, for for me, it's kind of I get it's kind of difficult for me sometimes because uh, I'm very specific about what I'm looking for most of the time. I uh, I like really dominant women. I'm really big into kink, huh? so that's like something mm -hmm. I really really enjoy. And uh, it kind of takes my wide dating pool, and it kind of does does this number right here, you know, because a yeah. lot of a lot of women in the kink community are submissive, and a lot of the guys are dominant. So we're a yeah. very small subset of that. And then there's even yeah. more of a subset where I like, or I'm looking for basically like people that like the same fetishes as me. So then it, it kind of shrinks it even more. And I've gotten lucky over the years, but for me, you know, I go to a bar and then sometimes like a girl will just want to go on a date, but like, we just want to hang out with me. And my first question is how much of a freak are you? And they're like, and then they'll look at me and be like, well, how much of a freak do I need to be? And I'm like, well, uh, <laughs> I'm into this, this, and this. And as soon as I say, like, for instance, I have a huge foot fetish. If I say, hey, I have a foot fetish, and they're, like, really turned off by it, whoosh, it's, 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 yeah. it's a done yeah. deal. I walk away from it, mm -hmm. like, instantly. Yeah. So it's like, for me, dating is such a small little box. But luckily, I've been lucky enough to find people that are into those things. Because uh, I, I was with a girl for like five years when I was younger and uh, in my early 20s. And she was very, very like, open minded. And she was really into kink, just like me. So it was a long five year relationship. And I actually got to learn more about myself having that relationship. So yeah, it's pretty useful. I I love um, that you are unabashedly willing to admit that you like dominant women. Yeah. Um, it's a dangerous thing for men to say that. Mm. It's, it's, it's almost like it, it, it's confronting for people. Mm. And um, it's funny because I recently was interviewed for an article on Inside Hook. I like Inside Hook. It's, a, it's kind of a man's digital magazine. Uh -huh. And it was about this guy who lived in the Southeast and he lived in a really small town. And he was like a big bear of a guy, but he liked to be dominated by his female partner. And uh -huh. he just couldn't find anybody in his local market like that. Sucks. And it, it, it it's it's limiting when you live in a rural area and oh, yeah. you're a bear who likes to be dominated you know it's like he's he's definitely one of a kind and it's in easy town. and it's easy here because we're in atlanta you know yeah, yeah. big city so mm -hmm. i get it that, exactly that's, it takes a big city uh, mm -hmm. but the other thing that i think is really interesting is that more and more and i and i also write articles for uh gentleman's way magazine every month i have a sex advice column in there and one of the articles i just finished was um, why domination and submission are old school thinking mm -hmm. and why being switchy is the new, you know, the, the new paradigm. Mm -hmm. um, I think people more and more, and I know that for me personally, <clears throat> this is what I've gone through recently over the last maybe um, five years, I've gone from being predominantly a, you know, more submissive, more feminine lover to becoming maybe over the last decade becoming so much more sexually confident uh -huh. that I could be in charge and run the bedroom game and enjoyed being with I, I had a boyfriend recently who was smaller than I and I'd never dated someone smaller than I am I'm, I'm quite a quite a large woman I'm mm. almost six feet tall mm. 
And um, I always wanted someone bigger than I because I, I didn't want to feel masculine. Mm. And I dated this guy for the last year who was smaller, mm. very, he, he wasn't femme in any way. He was a very much a man, mm. but he has this soft side to him. And he loves it when I take control. And I have just become so switchy and so much more comfortable um, saying what is and talking dirty and, you know, telling him what I'm going to do to him and doing things and all that stuff that I think women are starting to really move into enjoying that and being switchy. So mm. there are more and more, and men are becoming willing to mm. receive and allow, and they enjoy it and it doesn't diminish them. They get off on it. Mm. So you're, you're on the right track. There's more and more of it. And it's just become more and more common. And it's equally as fun for couples who it's not always their paradigm. It's just one of the ways that they play. Yeah, I, uh, you know, when it comes to me, I'm, I guess over the years, I've just become more open with it because I feel like, hey, if I, if I want something, I need to try to get it, yeah. you know, because yeah. like, exactly. I've been forced into vanilla relationships, and they usually only last like a month or two. And then I'm like, I'm out. Yeah. <laughs> and then they're like, exactly. why are you leaving? It's like, because uh, this is boring. And then they're like, yeah. They're like, oh, well, maybe I could try this. And I'm like, it's not going to work. <laughs> yeah. This is just how you are. This is just how I am. I just, we need to call it quits. And so I, you know, I, I've, I've had situations where I've met women who are submissive in the kink community and then they try to be a dom. Never, yeah. never works out most uh -huh. of the time. It's either a switch or a dom. That's the only one, the only way it's ever worked. I mean, you remember Willow. Yeah. Willow, yeah. Was, Willow was the most dominant woman I've ever met in my life. Like, like nice. when we first, when I first went over to her house, she smacked me in the face, knocked me on the ground, <laughs> and shoved a foot down my throat and, like, mm. called me a little bitch and a loser. And I was just, like, my dick was just instantly hard. And it was just, yeah. like, that's, that's like, I knew I liked that stuff before because I'd had many experiences with women. But, like, her, I, I, that, that kind of solidified it completely for me. So it was just, like, you know, yeah. interesting experience. with time, my wife has been more of a switch. Oh, interesting. Yeah. So right, that's what I was saying. And, yeah, uh, yeah. It's like, a, but I, I think that all happens just because, like, over time, we just started doing new things, and she just started getting more comfortable with herself. So it's now, confidence. Yeah, yeah. Now it's like sometimes, like while we're doing it, she's choking me. <laughs> nice. <laughs> like, uh, uh, like ever since I had my had my injuries and everything with my shoulders, I've always had like a problem with having some having her sit on my face. But <laughs> as, as of recently. We're back on that, and she's in full control, and it's amazing. I was like, I like nice. seeing how she's gotten more confident with herself in that, in that yeah. way. Well, I'm glad you're doing that. I yeah. think, I think a lot of a lot of men have this um, core wound around um, worried that they're going to be rejected or that they're not wanted for sex. They they mm. they feel ashamed mm -hmm. of their desire. And that's just all our societal repression bullshit, right? But when a woman is aggressive and dominant and going for it and she wants it, it sends him a signal that he can relax, that he is wanted. Mm -hmm. So she may not be super dommy. Mm -hmm. She may not be sticking her foot on your neck, but she can be running the game. That's kind of what I feel like is more like in the switchy zone. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And... When she's in charge and running the game, you're like, oh, yeah, she wants it. I'm mm. good. I can relax and have a good time now. I yeah. don't have to worry. <clears throat> yeah. yeah, I noticed for me, <clears throat> I had, like, um, erection problems for many years. And I found out it was not because I had, like, some, some kind of health problem. It was because I had no confidence issues. I had low confidence issues because I dated a partner <clears throat> very that abusive. was very abusive that oh. um, would, like, make me feel bad all the time. And, um, because of that, I started developing like confidence issues. So then when I would try to have sex with somebody, I wasn't relaxed enough to have like a nice, strong erection. I would be like on edge and stressed out, which raises your blood pressure and then makes it hard yeah. to get an erection, you know? And yeah. I didn't know that till I started seeing a therapist like a couple years ago. So 
Yeah, I have a, a really nice little book. Um, performance anxiety is so common mm. uh, for all people, not mm. just men. It's often associated with men, but women have as much, am I going to be able to come? You know, yeah. they have it too. Um, does he love me? Does he respect me? Does he think I'm pretty? You know, she's worried about all that stuff all the time. And that's because in her body, her physiology, she's estrogen driven and estrogen is a hormone of worry and safety. It's to make us feel safe because we are prey. Yeah. So that's why we also want men to give us security and safety. So, mm. cause we, men being testosterone driven are, are much more confident, much more goal oriented. They, they, they're not worried about their safety. They can take care of that. That doesn't even enter their mind. Most 99.9% .9 of the time. That's the first thing a woman worries about. And the last thing a guy worries about. So we come at these things from, from such a different angle. Yeah. And the, um, I, want, I was going to go somewhere with that. Hang on a second. Performance anxiety. Yeah. Um, so it's really, really common for guys, guys, about one in four men of all ages from 20 to 90 suffer from what, what is most commonly called premature ejaculation. Mm -hmm. Like they just can't last long enough. Mm -hmm. There are guys that also can't stay hard. Mm -hmm. Um, and one of the programs that I have, you know, I run a publishing company and, and I have these kind of like online programs that teach specific techniques. Mm -hmm. One is an expanded orgasm practice. One is female ejaculation. One is male multiple orgasm. And um, a lot of men are starting to become interested in becoming multi-orgasmic men, um, separating ejaculation from their orgasm. Like they, they, they couple them only because they think they should be coupled. You can have lots of full body orgasms and ejaculate whenever you want to. You don't have to ejaculate just to have an orgasm. It, it actually doesn't, they just get conflated in a man's mind. So that particular, the particular program teaches men how to do a technique called the me breath, M E breath, the me breath that is essentially a relaxation technique that uses um, a, a specific kind of breath work, mm -hmm. just a certain breathing pattern with a certain specific way of squeezing the pubococcygeus muscle, mm -hmm. which is, you know, the, the thing that closes off your pee yep. and a pelvic relaxation technique. Mm -hmm. And it's kind of like learning a golf swing or learning to drive a car where when the first time you drove a car, you're like, I got to look in the rear view mirror and look ahead and put it in drive and steer the wheel. Holy shit. How am I <laughs> going to do it on gas and brake? You know, but now it's like nothing, you know, you get the muscle memory in your body and it's so easy. And so that's essentially what the knee breath is. It's this re relaxation technique, but for so that's, that's what helps men last as long as they want to come when they want to. Mm. But one of the things that I give away as kind of a precursor to learning the me breath is a book called Get Hard Instantly on Command. And it's at gethardbook.com. It's free. And it has three techniques in it that are techniques that lower performance anxiety and help a guy not only get hard, but stay hard. And that's the beginning of lasting as long as he wants to until mm. he masters feeling more comfortable and getting out of performance, he's going to have stamina issues. Mm. And so it's kind of the on-ramp to that. And those three techniques are very, very good. And they're really, I honestly think they're helpful for almost all men because men are really very driven to please their lovers. They really want to do a good job. And for men, especially in our society, one of my friends, Dr. Terry Real, he talks about how men are raised in this packing order where women are raised in a more community or team orientation. And when men feel like they did something wrong, they go down in the packing order and that stresses them out. So they don't want to make mistakes and they don't want to do anything wrong. And so then they start, they start to worry and then they get performance anxiety mm. and it's all about getting out of catastrophizing the future, remembering some bad thing in the past and staying present. That is just a really helpful thing for guys that have premature ejaculation, want to last longer, performance anxiety. Um, so that might be something that can help your listeners. Okay. That's pretty interesting. Good to know. Yeah. Yeah. 
Yeah. Seems like you've uh, you've been doing this a very very long time. You like you pretty much Only twenty years. Yeah, that's like uh, you know that's, that's an amazing career. Yeah, it really. It's is. my second career, and I made it up. Oh, <laughs> oh nice. I was gonna say, what motivated you to do this <laughs> as your second career? Um, my husband and I almost got divorced about a decade into our marriage because um, I'd fucked him for eleven years straight, and I'd never come once from or- from intercourse. Oh, and wow. I was oh. just done fucking him. I just was like, I don't know, I'll do it, but it's not that good for me. And so then he was having an affair to get his needs met and stay in the marriage. Mm-hmm. And I was like, we we have to figure this out. How fucking hard can this be? And it's funny because I still hear a lot of sex experts out there saying, hey, if you can't come from intercourse, don't worry about it. You know, just focus on the clit and get some oral or use a vibrator. And and I'm like, okay, you try being married to a horny ass heterosexual man who wants to basically fuck every day (laughs) and you're not going to come and you think that's good advice. That is the worst advice in the world. What Tim and I had decided to do was just like, go fix our problem. How do you, how do you have good sex? And we went to, we went to therapists and they don't know, they don't know how to teach you how to have sex. They just help you with your like childhood trauma and shit, which I had plenty of, and we worked on that. But, um, we started taking sex workshops and instantly our sex life got hot. And we're like, oh my God, I started having orgasms from intercourse. I started be, you know, having female ejaculatory orgasms. He started becoming a multi-orgasm. And we're like, we need to take all these techniques and take all these great teachers and not expect people to get naked and go to workshops in Northern California and spend 30 <laughs> grand like we did getting an education. We need to make this stuff cheap and available to everyone anywhere on the interwebs and this was almost 20 years ago when my husband's actually the inventor of rhapsody the very first online music service and i happened to work for the company that invented the cable modem because before that we used (laughs) dial up which you millennials probably don't even remember i do (laughs) it was it was terrible (laughs) i I was i was four years old when we had dial up so exactly (laughs) that was so bad (laughs) yeah i remember like picking up the phone i remember picking up the phone I felt, like you got, I felt like you were getting a psychological attack <laughs> yeah, yeah, when you heard those noises coming through the phone. But really, he, he so he created Rhapsody. Yeah, he's the inventor of Rhapsody. We uh, he saw broadband coming, and he was like, we can stream broadband music anywhere to any device. I used, you know, I used, so. I used Rhapsody, and I used LimeWire back in the day. So Yeah, <laughs> yeah Rhapsody yeah. and LimeWire yeah. were the top things to use back yeah. in those days. That was way before yeah. Spotify and all that. So it's pretty funny. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Um, But so, you know, we just realized that when someone just teaches you how to fucking fuck, you can fuck. And um, I hope I'm allowed to say fuck on your show. Oh, Oh, you can swear all you want. (laughs) Yeah, Ours ours is explicit as hell, so we're good. That's what I figured. (laughs) And um, (laughs) you hadn't stopped me so far. Um, (laughs) So once we learned how to do it, we learned how easy it was. We wanted to bring all that knowledge to the Internet. And we were like the perfect people to do it because... We just knew broadband. We knew digital delivery. He'd invented Rhapsody. And we had this massive renaissance in our sex life. And we just wanted everybody to know that transforming having sex, I mean, anybody can make a baby. You can figure out how to stick tab A into slot B. But passionate lovemaking, super pleasurable techniques, those are learned skills. And they're not what you see on porn. That's just to have guys be able to jerk off. That's all that is. That's just jerk material. And that's not what women want unless they've grown up in that and that's all they know. But if they can see really beautiful, hot, kind of tantric, super sexy, very sensual, very heart connected, raptured lovemaking, then they're like, yeah, that's what I want. (laughs) I'll have some of that. (laughs) So that's how we got into it and what, what I've been doing for so many years. That's good. That's awesome. Yeah, I dig that. I, I, you know, I mean, I, I, I hope, you know, I'm, I'm glad that there's people like you because I feel like that's something that's kind of missing with a lot of people these days, you know, is just like the intimacy. It's never really develops. Yeah. It seems like it's just like, uh, you know, transaction. Yeah. Transaction. Yeah. You kind of, you know, you, you kind of come together you, you like somebody, you date them for a little while, and then it's like, oh, I don't like this little minor thing about this person, so I'm just going to leave now. Uh, you know, one thing that I've been studying, you know, over the, you know, for a while 
is uh, one thing that one th- bad thing that happens with people our age and younger, especially with like Gen Z, is mm-hmm. uh, a lot of hypergamy happens. You know, like basically a lot of women my age and younger, they'll typically uh, seek out high expectations for some men. They'll, they'll be looking like they'll, the, the the woman will be like, you know, she'll be like in the top like. 20 or 30 percent of women but she, then she'll be expecting like a top one percent guy and the same thing mm-hmm. happens for a lot of guys I know they'll yeah they'll yeah, be yeah. they'll be like a like like you know like a five out of ten but then they'll they'll expect to get a woman who's like top they basically like top 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 ten percent or top five percent top one percent of women and you know th- nobody and and you can't sit there and tell them that that's unrealistic because they'll sit there and they'll dismiss you and they'll say oh you're what do you know you're a loser you know they it's the thing is I wish some of these people would listen more. Because I think it's okay for people to date, you know, people on their level or date somebody who doesn't necessarily make like a ton of money, but makes enough money for y'all to be comfortable. And there's, like I said, there's like this hypergamy where, you know, I met a, I met a, I met a lady the other day who, um, you know, her expectations are is she wants a guy that's fit all the time. She wants a guy who basically makes half a million dollars a year. He wants, he does this, he does that. He's like six, five. But then when you take a look at her, She's not putting in the work to get a guy like that. She's out of shape. She doesn't have anything to offer. She doesn't really have a career of her own. She lives with mom and dad. But it's not just women. It's guys, too. I know guys that are like that. Yeah. You know, yeah. we, we, went to, we went to college with a guy, um, oh, yeah. this really heavy set guy. And um, he just, he, he always said he wanted to date, like, really hot girls. But then, like, you look at him and you're like, well, you're not putting in the work to get a hot girl. What are you, what are you doing to, to do that? And he would just, yeah. he would just, you know, he wouldn't go to the gym. He wouldn't, he wouldn't try to learn new skills. He wouldn't try to figure out a way to, you and, know, make himself a better person. And now what he is is he's more predatory because what he does is he has adopted more of the woke mentality. Uh, he's kind of a predator at this point. Yeah, so what he what he does is he says that he's a feminist, but really what he is is he's the kind of guy who's kind of slimy. He'll basically try to say he's a feminist to get a woman because, you know, a lot of a lot of women like, you know, feminism. So like he'll he'll yeah. say that he's a feminist and he's not really a feminist. He's just saying that so he can so a very misogynistic human being. Yeah, he's too. a very misogynistic human being. He tries to get his little foot in the door to try to get that. You know, and I try to explain to him, I was like, you know, be a masculine guy and and try to do the right thing and you'll find the right woman for you. And he just, you know, he doesn't listen to that. He he just wants mm-hmm. to He's a he's a predator, so he he's a doesn't predator. have yeah. he doesn't understand what it means. No, like no, do, no doesn't mean anything to him. He just enjoys the fact that he gets his rocks off at the end of the day. Yeah, absolutely. Wow. Yeah, and how depressing it is to know somebody like that. Well, I hope you guys are continuing to hammer on him for being such an asshole. <laughs> <laughs> well, we don't, we don't, we haven't seen him in a long time. But we actually yeah. had his ex friend here on the podcast a couple podcasts ago. Yeah, and we were, he was, uh, he yeah. was also in agreement with that one. Yeah, and he and see now he's in a very w- interesting situation. You know, I won't, I'm not going to say his name on the air because I don't want to you know use yeah. any names. But like, basi- right, but, but, yeah, but basically he's in a situation where um, he's dating this girl who has a has a has a boyfriend, and he said it's kind of a cuckolding relationship type of thing, mm-hmm. and. Mm-hmm. You know, we've known this guy for a long time, and we were just surprised. So is he the cuckold? Or no, no, is he, the he's the he's he's the bull. He's the bull he's in the, the relationship. Yeah. And it's really mm-hmm. interesting because we were like, man, we didn't expect you to be like that, dude. Yeah, <laughs> he took us by surprise. <laughs> yeah, because like we always knew him as this like really quirky, like nerdy dude, and then we're like, dang, he's stepping it up. <laughs> well, you know, it's funny because the same guy who is a shitbag hated him for getting laid at comic cons and stuff like that because he was actually going out and he was like trying to get laid and he was actually talking to people yeah and and exchanging ideas and this guy would get jealous of this the, the same guy he we were would, talking about would like that's a that's a predator would get jealous of him doing stuff like that and it's like we well, don't get mad at him he's just he he's just like, he just he's just he's just like he's he's got the game and he's working it like let, you know exactly. d- be happy for him because they, they were supposedly best friends yeah, and you know? he was always getting mad at him. Like I remember, he was he was complaining to me one time back in the day, and he was like, he was like, yeah, I just can't believe you know he left me to go and hook up with this chick in her <laughs> hotel room. I was like, how about you know pat your friend on the back and say you good got job, this, dude. bro. <laughs> good job, dude. He said you're having yeah. a good time, man. Like I don't know, it's it's really bizarre. It's just there's a there's a lot of that going on uh, nowadays, and you know like. One of the things I get really, uh, you know, like 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 on dating apps, one thing that really happens now is if, if you're a centrist 
and somebody's like on the left, though they will they will automatically not want to talk to you. And yeah. that's that's happened to me. And you know, when I was in college, I was very much a very very left leaning person. And as I've gotten mm-hmm. older, I've become more like in the middle. I'm more of a moderate, mm-hmm. you know. Mm-hmm. And I've had people who don't want to date me because they're like, oh, yeah. you're you're like a moderate. I don't want to date you because you're a moderate. And it's like, oh well, I, I don't know what to tell you about that. And you know, I kind of move on from that. But I've I notice that happens more and more, and that's, you know, the primary dating app that I've used in the past is OkCupid. Are you, are you familiar with that one? Sure, yeah. of course. Um, what, what has been your experience with that dating app? Because it's like one of the most popular ones. Oh, gosh. I think in some ways it depends. I mean, OkCupid is very large, mm-hmm. obviously. Tinder um, Tinder's in, in Tinder seems to have Yeah, Tinder's the biggest. Then there's <laughs> Bumble, you, you know, which if, if you want to – Women do like to use that. App. I like I like Bumble. And, and, I like Bumble. Yeah. I, like, I like it because women make the first move. I think that's why I like it so much. Mm. I like that too. Well, mm. you would like that. Yeah. And um, <laughs> there's there's Field F E E L D, which mm. is for like the poly kink crowd, which I think is also good. There's mm. Adult Friend Finder for mm. kind of like the swinger lifestyle people. Um, you know, there's so many different apps out there. Mm. Um, so I think they're they're all good. You have to just, there's match, you know, if you want to get married, there's match. Mm. There's all the J dates and all those kinds of things too. And I wouldn't worry. I think it's, if you are, if you're a moderate and you put Mm. that on your profile, Mm. you are weeding out the people who don't want to be with you. And that is what you need to do. The more refined your profile is, the more that you can say who you are and what you stand for, and what you're looking for, mm. the better off you'll be because it's all just casting a net. Yeah, that makes sense. I mean, that, and that's what you were saying from the beginning. And I, you know, I kind of take that to heart because uh, one thing I would really hate is to get in a relationship with somebody and feel like I'm walking on eggshells every two seconds. I just right. don't want to don't no. want to deal with that because I've, I've yeah. been in relationships like that. When I was in college, I dated this girl who was very, very also abusive. Very abusive towards me, and I, you know, like be, because and because because I like kink, you know, I kind of put up with it a little bit more with her. But the mm-hmm. thing was, is uh, she had a undiagnosed borderline personality disorder, and mm-hmm. she was either unaware of it or just ignored it. Uh, yeah. But it was very bad, uh, and I actually, I, I actually say that in my profiles now. I won't date you if you have borderline personality disorder. I just, yeah, just not doing it, you know, because yeah. Too many bad experiences with some. I've dated two people that had it now, and each experience was yeah. not great for me. So, I mean, it's it's probably it's probably okay if they have it treated, but you know, I never would know because if they have it treated and under control, I would never even suspect. But yeah, typically when it comes to like mental disorders, if they're really extreme, I typically won't go for it because yeah. it'll it'll, in my opinion, it kind of you know it it, it affects me because I'm I'm also autistic, so. Um, I pay attention to the little details <laughs> a little bit too much. Yeah. Oh, that's all right. <laughs> yeah. It takes all kinds. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I, I do. Um, I do think that there are so many people now who are also on meds, antidepressants and mm. anti-anxiety meds and things like that. So it doesn't even have to be, um, you know, bipolar or yeah. mood spectrum or any mm. of those kinds of things. It, it can just be like straight up de- antidepressants and anxiety and, it's it's a worthwhile thing to ask people what meds they're on. Oh, absolutely. Oh, yeah. And I think I'm a firm believer that uh, <laughs> antidepressants probably kill intimacy too in a lot of ways. Yeah, of uh, course they do. Yeah. They do. And they also make you really – they make you gain weight easily too. And that's mm. – they tried to put me on it's an – Depressing. Anti- <laughs> yeah, it's depressing. Yeah. They, tried to, they tried to put me on an antidepressant uh, when I was younger. And I said, no, that's not going to happen because um, I knew I know way too much about them. And, you know, mm. I, I just – couldn't do it you know and they wanted to do that because i had undiagnosed autism and autism Mm -hmm. autistic people have uh depression and anxiety it's just part of being autistic and you know i'd rather solve the overall problem than just try to self-medicate with like whatever kind of prescription pills they try to give me you know of course one of the things that i i can see happening very very soon in the future Mm -hmm. is um an online dating app for people who have mood spectrum disorder, Mm. autism, ADHD, whatever it might be, because when you have it and you understand it and you can manage it, you are more likely to find someone who is like you and can Mm. understand that too. 
Yeah. So it wouldn't surprise me with the sheer number of people who are on things like antidepressants and anti-anxiety meds, et cetera. And ADHD dating, that's a that's an entire category. As a matter of fact, um, Dr. Erica Miley, who is a friend of mine, she has a podcast. Every, uh, every year in January, I do her show with her and I do a, like a dating trends show. Mm-hmm. She's very intellectual and super fun and just wicked smart. And I love, I love to do that, that annual dating or that annual sex trends show with her. Mm -hmm. She's actually working on an entire kind of construct and system around ADHD dating Mm. and relationships and Hmm. uh, coping mechanisms and strategies for people with ADHD who are date in dating and relationships. And that's, that's a, that's not a small niche. That's a big market. That is a really big market. Uh, yeah, more and more people I mean, get diagnosed I was, with that every year. I mean, I was able to find an app for kink BDSM friendly people that's dating. So I wouldn't be surprised if one of those apps <laughs> pop, pop, pops up in the future. That's very that's very yeah. cool. That's pretty awesome. And it sounds like she's got some doing some good work. And Definitely. you know, I'm glad uh, mental health is one of those things. I'm glad more and more people are kind of looking into it because I feel like for a long time, you know, especially when I was younger, when I was in high school, even when I was younger in high school, I was in high school in 2006. You know, like I feel like people just didn't take mental health serious back then at all. Like it was like, oh, there's something wrong with you. Uh, suck it up. <laughs> yeah, I, I remember having a yeah. lot of issues and no, everybody was like, well, you know, your grandparents had it worse. Just think about how easy you have it. <laughs> I'm like, well, shit, you know what? I guess um, I guess I'm just going to go fuck myself right now. <laughs> yeah, yeah, my, yeah, my, exactly. grandpa- my, my grandparents are from the great generation, so they grew up during the – World War, World War II, yeah. depression. They, yeah. you know, my grandfather was in World War II. He was actually at D Day. Very quiet yeah. guy. I think he had a lot of mental health problems. He just never fixed, but he just like yeah. dealt with it with alcohol and and that's <laughs> anger. A, and that's the thing is like when the Vietnam, when the generation that was sent to Vietnam came back, they a lot of them came back addicted to drugs, and yeah. they their a lot relationships. Of PTSD. And a lot of the relationships. Yeah, you would, and you you would have been a very young child uh, during the Vietnam yeah. era, so you you probably yes, exactly. you probably I remember it. You probably remember like some of those like older people coming back and being like pissed off. I mean, uh, we interviewed this guy yeah, named that's... Scott on the podcast, and he's he's seventy, and uh, he yeah. was telling us that you know it was really bad to be in the military back then because yeah. you would come back and they would just hate the hell out of you. They would spit on They'd you. They'd spit on you. They were just like really rude yeah. to you. And you know, like, like, you know, back then guys didn't have a choice. They were drafted. They had to, they had to go. Yeah. And so. even if you do, if you do enlist on your own free will, you never really expect what you're going to get out of yeah. your contract. Makes it's sense. like a, a lot of my <laughs> friends when we were first going to college together suffered from PTSD because they went to combat. He's in the Marines. <laughs> so, Thank you. Mm. Thank you. <laughs> thank you very much. Yeah. <laughs> so. yes, thank you. But it's like, yeah, it's like I never, I never got deployed like they did. So it was like, you get, you find yourself feeling lucky in a sense that you didn't, you didn't have to deal with that kind of stuff that they did, and you feel bad watching people struggle that way, because yeah, it affects their personal relationships and everything. You had guilt. Yeah. You had guilt because you didn't have active duty, even though you were semper fi and showed up for it. <laughs> Yeah, it, it, it was like, and like being active and being broken down, like being broken down and built up again, and never, never being in a sense like a part of that. It kind of yeah. it does give you a little bit of guilt, but it, over time you get over it because one of my hmm. friends that we actually do the podcast with, he helped uh, he helps me out with it because I was in a much worse place, and he was talking to me and helping me understand that it was a chapter of my life. You yeah. know, look at it for what it is. Yeah. You know, and you know, finally open up that new chapter in life and advance. And it's helped me out a lot, but we definitely say that there's a lot of guys out there who don't get the help that they need and it creates a struggle for them every day. So we're at the two minute warning. Oh, oh shoot. Oh shit. <laughs> so well, we got to wrap it up then. Yep. What are we going to, how are we going to end it? End it with oh, a bang. End it with a bang. So, um, just in, <laughs> I guess in like a few sentences, um, what is your advice to Gen Z and millennials about dating? Just, just real quick, just couple, couple, couple. It, it can be, it can be just, it can be ridic- as ridiculous as you want it to be. <laughs> just, just, just fun, just something funny, just something funny. I would say it's, it's really about collecting the the stories because mm. because it's a numbers game, and you're going to get to meet a lot of people, and you're not going to like most of them enough <laughs> to date them. <laughs> but if you could take 10% of the, 
of that experience as something that you can use going forward. Everybody's got something to give. Everybody's got gems. Everybody's got some knowledge, something to offer. Mm -hmm. And if you just go into your meet and greets with, hey, nothing might come of it. This is a lot of fucking work. So I'm going to get something out of it. What's my 10% from this person and this interaction? That will help keep you going while you search for the one or ones who make you the happiest. Wow. That's amazing. That is very uh, inspirational. I like that. Yes, it is. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> well, we appreciate you having being on the podcast today. Oh, um, well, thank you so much for asking me. Yeah. I really appreciate getting to know the two of you. Oh, yeah. We were, awesome. uh, we were just really impressed. You know, we looked at your resume and you definitely had a, you know, you had a lot, yes. uh, a lot going on. You know, we, we noticed that you were on like a lot of news networks and you were, um, also you know, on a lot of other podcasts as well. Yeah. Before this. Yeah. We saw, we saw like a couple, we, we, we basically did a good bit of research today before we yes. like, called. So we wanted to make sure, even though I work, I work a full-time job. I'm a, I direct marketing videos for a living. I actually work in, I'm a filmmaker. That's what I do for a living. I know. I saw your website. I was yeah. very impressed with yeah. the films that you're working on. Oh, thanks. Yeah. I, I produce all my own videos myself. Mm -hmm. um, I have hundreds of them at betterlover.com. Mm -hmm. And I love, I, you know what I love? I mm -hmm. love to go into the studio and do green screen and then come up with like crazy backgrounds <laughs> and just teach people hot sex techniques. That's funny. And uh, so if you want to see any of my videos, they're at betterlover.com. I dress up in crazy outfits <laughs> and use crazy backgrounds and try to give people lots of great ideas. <laughs> well, cool. Well, we, uh, we'll check it out. We actually saw like one or two already. Um, and we were, we were, we we're definitely laughing when we were watching it because it's oh, funny. Yeah. So it, uh, I don't know. We just like your energy. Your energy is very, yes, it's funny. It's outgoing. And, um, I feel like you, you don't pull any punches. You just, you're blunt and you tell people how it is. And I like that. It's you unfiltered know. and it's fun. <laughs> So. People, people pr appreciate that. Yes. Absolutely. Yeah. Good. All right, you guys. We'll have a beautiful rest of the day. Thank, Thank you. you so much for having me on the show. Mm -hmm. I look forward to connecting again anytime. And if there's anything I can do to help either of you or any yeah. of your fans and followers, oh. I'm here. Well, yeah. Thank well, you uh, very yeah, much. yeah. This, uh, this, this will be out uh, in next week on yes. Friday. Great. Uh, so Great. we'll, we'll, we'll be sure to link all your stuff in the, in our, in our episode. We're going to be, yeah, on... my Instagram is a good way. A lot of okay. people like to DM me. So at Susan Bratton, all right. my awesome. name, just my right. name, we'll Susan that. Bratton. Um, yep. and I just did this incredible photo shoot in LA with a, a celebrity photographer. I called it leggy Palooza because yeah. I do work out every day. Mm -hmm. awesome. And, uh, so I'm going to be dropping a, a whole bunch of really sexy pictures. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> because right. if you're 60 and you're a sex expert, you mm. should be fucking sexy. Absolutely. So I am. That's and I try that. I mean, like, I got to represent for my generation. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. And if you can. Who put the boom in boomer? <laughs> <laughs> I love it. <laughs> or the boobs. <laughs> yeah, honestly, I think I think you're really beautiful. Really, Very really beautiful. beautiful. And I, and I you, you know, so I, th I think you're stunning now. So you, when you were 20, you must have been like. Amazing. Killing every, like, you must have been like a goddess, like just killing it, slaying yes. it. Like, I bet you were slaying it. I think I'm prettier than I've ever been. I think. Wow. I, I, I think that, that's amazing. Um, I've gotten prettier as I age. Wow. That's. And I think a lot of people do. A good thing. I've seen that, you know, and I've seen yeah. that happen with a lot of people. Uh, there was an Asian guy. He was, he's like, they asked him how old he was. He said he was 55, but he looked like he was in his 20s. And like, when I look at you, you said you're 60. You look like you could be in your 30s. Yes. Easily. Good. I feel like it. I feel like I'm in my 30s, and I'm coming like I'm in my 30s. Yeah. <laughs> hey, it's that's what it is. It's the sex. It's, it's the sexual sex. energy. Yeah, and you're. you're it's uh, the orgasms. And, and then all the guys, you, all the guys you have sex with, they probably they you, you suck some of their life force out. <laughs> mm, I definitely do. I got a nice little spongy tissue there that sucks it up. <laughs> And you always say, say, stay sexy, right? Yep. Stay sexy, Atlanta. <laughs> he, always, he always says, stay sexy, Atlanta. It's funny. I love it. <laughs> but yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll make sure uh, if you, if you can, um, if you have a thumbnail in mind, cause I want to put you as the thumbnail for this video. Just, if you have a okay. thumbnail in mind, just email it to me and we'll, we'll put it up there. I will do it. So. All right. That sounds great. All right, All right you guys take, so, take care. All right. Take thanks. Care. Bye -bye. All right. Bye. And stay sexy, Atlanta. Thank you for listening to this episode of the Dumb, Cool, and Weird Podcast with Wes and Nick. If you want to check out more of our stuff, go to www.dumbcoolweird.com. You'll find our Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, Instagram, and Patreon link if you want to support us. 
Also, be sure to check out our merch store. And if you're interested in being on our podcast, you can find a link on our website so you can reach out to us and tell us if you want to if you want to talk to us about something that's really weird, dumb or cool. We'd be glad to hear from you. Hope you'll stay tuned for the next weird ass episodes we got. Thank you.